And I put this picture up here just because it's really important to me and it ties in with this story. And I will tell you more about, I'll give you the intro about Pump Russell so then you'll understand why I really needed to search Margaret out. Uh, this is my mom when she was in her late 80s and we were down in Kittery on Garrett Island. Do any of you know that Kittery area or any, do any of you have ancestors? It's right down at the bottom of the border, okay? And they all came on as fishermen, but they became extraordinarily wealthy. Anyway, there was this family lore that there was a tablet stone um, for a Timothy Garrett and Sarah Elliott. And it was a really big deal to find it. And I went to their historical society and the old timer said to me, no, 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 I've never heard of that stone. I had a 101 year old great uncle who said, Judy, I will drive you to where it is. I remember with your great grandmother, I know it exists. So my niece came from California and my mother wanted to show her the tablet stone. It is on Garrett Island. All right. And the other image, I think, wait a minute, let me get the pointer. The other image you will see over here is the tomb of all the pepperels, the early pepperels, all right? And they were a big deal in Maine. They're, there's even a pepperel mass, okay? Mm -hmm. But well, William was the first pepperel and like 19 people are buried in that tomb. And behind it still existing is the pepperel house, which I'll show you a picture of. And there was this tablet here honoring both Colonel William Pepperell, um, from whom I'm descended, and his son, from whom I'm not, and I'm grateful, and you'll understand why in a bit, okay? But the son named William was really important in Maine history because there was a big battle of Lewisburg in Nova Scotia, and we won it, but the we was the British won it, okay? And he is the only known baronet that we've ever had. In. <laughs> but you know, when I was a kid with my mother doing ge genealogy, finding places like this were really important. And she had to share it with, my, with her granddaughter. It was really critical to her to be able to do that. And we were pretty proud. And then this story unfolded. So at the beginning, I was looking for Pomp Russell, and I'll tell you why in a bit. But he was indeed an infant enslaved, brand new, right, taken right out of his mother's arms. Um, and he became a free man of color in Weld, Maine. And it's fine to do the genealogy on a man's line, but it's really hard to do genealogy on a black man's line. And then I got thinking. He married a woman he lived with his whole life and she bore him two children. And I've done tons of work looking for their um, descendants and they're not there. So I thought, well, I'm gonna honor, I need to find Peggy. I need to see what I can do about finding Peggy. My conclusion at the end of Pomp's story was that Pomp and Peggy's is really a main story. Initially, I thought it was a Weld main story, but it is a story of family and extended family. It's a story of beginnings. We're talking towns that were, didn't even have a name yet, plantation number three or plantation number five, okay? Um, and the lives of the earliest settlers. We're talking 1700s. Um, and Pomp's story spoke to me as I discovered, I found out what they valued. They really valued each other. They depended on each other to survive. You needed someone to birth your children. You needed, you needed help to cut down those trees and deal with the timber and start the gristmill. 
Um, they that crew in Weld who settled in Weld, um, they really valued education. They came from Andover, Mass. That's where Phillips Andover was. It's where Andover Newton Theological started. It's where Phillips Exeter came into being, et cetera. But what I found with these well people is they were white, black, and brown. They were indigenous as well. Kip and Ken, who built a life together in Weld, Maine. And this is in the Webster Masterman Cemetery up on Center Hill in Weld. And this is Pomp's grave. And because many of you belong to the Maine Old Cemetery Association, <laughs> <laughs> You know how we sometimes use the electronic device to find graves? And some of us also douse. Peggy's right next to him. I actually had Ralph take photos of me dowsing and watching the rods. Actually, did a video, which believe. Okay, so now I'm searching for Margaret Cut in what is called ancient Piscataway. And what I find are shipwrights, slaveholders, and plantation owners across four generations. And the names, because I did the genealogy, the names I honed in on were Cut, Gray, Pepperell, Sparha, Elliot, and Garish. Those families were all of Kittery and the royals of the royal plantation and slave quarters that still exists in Medford, Massachusetts. You can go down and visit it, as I have. So, Pomp's story briefly. It was born from two stories. I stumbled across the first American anti-slavery almanac, a document I didn't know existed. And in it, they were all listed out by towns and it covered Maine to Rhode Island and out to Ohio. And I thought, oh, I've got nothing to do with COVID. You know, so I took all those towns and I plunked them into states. And lo and behold, I find Farmington, Maine and Weld, Maine, which are towns just separated by Weld. They're very close together in mid-Maine. And I'm going, wait a minute, this is 1834. Any slavery societies? in these two towns that are so young, it didn't make any sense to me. And then I was sharing that with friends and a woman in the group said to me, Judy, where on earth are you from in Maine? And I told her and she said, I was born there. And she said, and I have a family story and this woman's older than I am and I'm pretty old. Okay, she said, I have a family story that I learned when I was an adolescent and I didn't know what to do with this story. I've never known what to do with this story. And she said, my family married into a Russell family. And as I heard the story, the, the wife, uh, the Bethia, who, who I now know is Bethia Russell. Bethia birthed her firstborn and she lost it. The baby died within a couple of days. And she was so bereft that, as Sally tells the story, her husband got on a horse from Andover, Mass, and rode to Charlestown and came home with a black infant in his side set. Okay? to take care of her needs. So much for the mother's needs, <laughs> the birth mother's needs, right? And she said, I know no more than that, except he's in a cemetery in Wells, buried under a New Hampshire Revolutionary War story, a stone. And I thought, well, oh, this is easy. I'll make, I'll, uh, when I get off our Zoom meeting, I'll do some research and that will help Sally feel better. It has turned into a massive story. Anyway, this is what I know. Um, Pomp spent nine years growing up in Andover, Massachusetts. That's where Phillips Andover is. Okay. The family went across the Merrimack River 
to the southern part of New Hampshire to a town called Wilton. And then I know nothing about Trump until he becomes 16 because General Stark has heeded the call because what wasn't Vermont yet said the British are coming, the British are coming, they're taking over, they're gonna win the war. If you want any of our land, you better get your act together and send some troops over. So within three days time, evidently Stark amassed something like 2,500 troops sending out riders. And I have Pump's military records and I know when Pump signed up. Okay, the rider was going through town. So at that point, I know that I can find his military records and he is at the quite decisive battle of Bennington. Um, but he's 16. And the amount of time you spent in the service at that time was very little. So he was back home at 16. What I didn't tell you is that he became the oldest of 11 children, but he was the only black child. And I have his baptism records and they have him record and they always did it hoping kids would live. They didn't baptize until a little ways in. So three years later, he's baptized as servant to Thomas and Beth Lewis. Okay, so he may be the oldest child, but he's a servant. And in fact, that means he's a, he's enslaved. Okay, Lore has it that he was freed on his twenty first birthday. I have no proof of that. In seventeen eighty eight, he marries. Margaret Cott. And when I found that document, that was bingo. I saw her name, her last name. That meant that would be the name of the person who, or the family who would enslave her. But I was still working on Pomp's story, so I didn't get started on Margaret's yet. So they get married, but it's very cool. They get married by General Moses Nichols, who was Pomp's regimental commander. It, that still gives me chills to say out loud. Okay. And that ties in with a whole other story that I will bore you with sometime, maybe. In between 1789 and 1804, they own a farm. They pay taxes. Peggy joins the church with her two boys, and they raise their two sons in Packersfield, uh, Packersfield, New Hampshire. And I'll show you where that is on a map. In 1805, he and Peggy join 11, seven of the 11 siblings moving to help settle Weld, Maine. Seven of the siblings. Doesn't that knock your socks? We know this area. <laughs> we have some old history to go. Um, and I think Pomp dies. I can find no real records of this. I think he dies in about 1838. And he's buried under that New Hampshire Revolutionary War stone. And we truly do hope Peggy rests beside him. So now I need to explore my, I've gotten Pomp done, as done as he's going to be for right now. And I really need to turn to Margaret because I'm a feminist. I'm sorry. Is that simple? Not I'm sorry. All right. I really need to know about Margaret's life. So I needed to explore a theory, uh, explore a theory I had because I recognized that new last name, Cut. Okay, there is no S on that on the tail of that name, and I wanted to know how she might have met Pomp Russell, and quite frankly, this is pure inferential genealogy. And I will never be able to prove this. I honestly don't think I will, but I have enough evidence that makes me feel confident enough to present, get it out there as likely. So I'm excited about my theory and I'm thrilled to be heading back to 
home genealogical territory, because I really relate to the Pepperells and the Garrises, as you saw in that first slide with my mother. I'm delighted to be running more genealogy lines. Those our records in Maine are a gold mine, and Southern Maine is just remar remarkable. They documented absolutely everything. So that's all well and good. And then as I'm seeking context about Peggy and how she might have been related to the Cut family, I'm deeply startled to learn some real truths that I never knew before and could have learned earlier about had I but looked. My ancestors were related to the Pepperells and they to the Cuts, who built and sailed the ships and they all owned and traded black enslaved human beings. And if you haven't had that experience, I tell you, it pulls you right up short. We have been a big part of the slave trade. That's how we, we live, we're on the coast. So I fell in love with this map. It's a 19th century engraving depicting the slave trade routes in the 17th and 18th century. They, they gathered those slaves on the west coast of Africa. They moved them down to the sugar plantations, the sugar colonies of the, of the West Indies and elsewhere. We are right up here listed as the fishing colonies. New Englanders were trading fish and timber. And we got rum, molasses, sugar, and enslaved Africans. Um, we sent down, the language I've come across is we sent down our trash fish. That fish was to feed the enslaved people in the, on the sugar plantations. Um, and we sent down timber because they had already depleted all the timber to build their houses and they needed uh, and they needed all the land to plant for with sugar, plant down sugar. This um, document, this bill of sale, is on the main memory net network. You can access it and you will see lots of people now who are doing these kinds of presentations use this particular document. It essentially says in 1719, one Negro woman consigned to Mr. William Pepperell from the Barbados. And he could tell because right here, you see, it says marked with a Y on her right shoulder. So she was branded. And I ended up finding that either Pepperell or the two Pepperells, William and William, uh, is said to have owned a hundred 30 ships. So I had to figure out how I was going to find Margaret and how she might be related to these families. And at the same time, having done Pomp's presentation, I needed to also do it in such a way that I could turn it into a presentation that would make sense to people. So I looked for a girl close to Margaret's age for a bit of context. And then I really laid out what I knew about Margaret and I continued to add to that. I like last time I shared, I love maps. I have, it's a real weak thing. I love old maps. They are so wicked cool. All right. And I find that maps ground me. I, I need place, okay? But on, in this particular presentation, I really needed to be able to figure out how to show the level of privilege that was out there that allowed them to simply enslave people to allow that privilege to exist. Okay, so I went looking for homes and I went looking for portraits. Well, they sure you see some of these portraits, okay? And then I wanted to lay out my theory about, it's one thing that Margaret got born and lived likely in Kittery, but how could she have met Tom Russell? And um, could I make sense of all that? So here is 
the young woman, and I couldn't believe I, the timing was such. There is a poet who is now much, um, much honored in researching her background and re-examining her poetry. Her name is Phyllis Wheatley. She was born in West Africa about 1753. She was sold to a trader at age, age eight in Africa, and she was shipped to Boston. She was bought and enslaved as a servant to John Wheatley in Boston. He bought her for his wife. This is where it becomes more real to me. Phyllis arrived on a slave ship when she was eight years old. And that was the year 1761, the year Pomp, and I suspect, I know for certain that that's the year Pomp was born. And I'm guessing that Margaret was pretty much his same age, but that is purely speculative, okay? But Pomp would have just been born. So this is all we truly know, and I've already told you some of it. Um, in June of 1788, Margaret Cott married Pomp Russell in Amherst, Mass. They settled on their farm in Packersfield. In 89, Peter was born, and their second son, Zeta, was born five years later. Peggy and the boys joined the Packersfield Church. Peggy sang in the choir. She was a black woman in a little tiny, tiny hamlet in New Hampshire. And she sang in the choir with the rest of them. And about 1805, they moved to Wells, which was still the province of Maine, called the province of Maine. And she lived, she and Pomp and their children, Pomp, they're now older in their 40s. They're living with family on Center Hill, and I've got documents that show their properties, okay? And they all lived near each other. I showed you this map before. This is Jeffrey's 1755 map, and this is just to get your give you your bearings. This is the border of Massachusetts, and New Hampshire is now a state. Maine is still part of Massachusetts. Andover, Mass. is right about here. They cross over the border. No, nope, Vermont doesn't even exist yet. This is a state of New Hampshire, Mass. Um, Pomp and Peggy would have been in their early 30s. This is a close-up of the southern part of that map. They crossed over the Merrimack River. Pomp lived in Wilton, New Hampshire with the rest of the Russell family. He married Peggy here um, in Amherst, New Hampshire. And this is where Packersfield, New Hampshire is, which is now, by the way, called Nelson. We are coming over to the coast. This is Portsmouth and that means Kittery's right here, okay? I titled this in ancient Piscataway, and it was called that because of the Piscataqua River that runs down through. This is Portsmouth. You Portsmouth, deep port, you've got long wharfs. Those are all the wharfs, the shipping wharfs, okay? Um, Badger's Island, where some of my ancestors were, they built ships there, all right? This slide I put in, this little caption right there, I put in only because I had to when I found it. That's what the America's, what America's naval shipyard looked like in 1808. That's our shipyard right here. Here is a Another map of Portsmouth done later, but you can now see it on a larger scale. Where's my, there it is. This is all Portsmouth. You can see the docks, the wharfs. This is the Piscataqua River coming down. 
and it opens into the Atlantic Ocean. This is Kittery. I put a star here just because I thought it might intrigue you. This is what almost 40, a little over 40 years later, our naval shipyard looked like, where we built submarines, et cetera. All right, and this was the timber dock, because what did you build boats out of? So the only reason I have this map here is because all the colored section that is so hard to see is all kittery. So that's the that's the land we're talking about. And this, and this is Portsmouth over here. This is New Hampshire. Here's the, you see this line right here? That's the border between New Hampshire and Maine. This is Garish Island right here. This is Cut Island. Okay. That's clear. All right, this is the genealogy that I believe Margaret is the family she would have grown up in and been a servant to. There were three cup brothers, Robert, John, who became the first president of the province of New Hampshire, and Richard. Well, Richard was easy. He daughtered out, so there were no sons to be born with a cut last name. And I needed I, I needed to go down further because of, I thought Margaret would be married and would be born about what did I say? 60. I always do this. 1761. Okay. Well, they came to New Hampshire and Maine from Wales. Robert came by way of the Barbados. He was a real clue for me. And I had already looked at John's genealogy too, and that one wasn't panning out. All right, so I focused in on Robert. And Robert died in 1674. He was definitely of Italy. Um, he had a son, Richard, and Richard had a son, Richard, who married Eunice Cut, whose husband, whose father, was um, a shipbuilder in Kittery. All right, so there were already great connections, family connections. I truly believe that she was most, at that family of Richard and Eunice Curtis were the ones most likely to have been slave to Margaret, whether she was born into the family or brought to the family. I have no way of knowing. I'm showing these other pieces, but I'm gonna skip through them very quickly. I had to write this out because I needed to come to my own reckoning of my own family's involvement. Garrish Island, there's my Timothy Garrish and Sarah Elliott Garrish, all right? And all three of Richard's children married into that very family. So that meant, and Garrett, you saw Garrish Island and Cut Island were joined together, okay? They all knew each other. They knew the enslaved people on the island. Um, one of the signers of our Declaration of Independence from New Hampshire was a man named William Whipple. Again, Richard II had a brother named Robert, and I did that line out, and there I find William Whipple. Well, there is a very famous, um, there's a lot of information about William Whipple, the very wealthy merchant in Portsmouth. And he had a, an enslaved man called Prince Whipple, and Prince Whipple actually went to war with him in the revolution. Um, and they married into the Moffats. I'm not going to say all this, but the Pepperells, Sparhawks, and Garishes, I needed to lay out all their lines because I needed to do my own reckoning. So Richard too had a will. I love those old will books. Oh my gosh. It's like holding magic in your hands, okay? Um, 
In his will, he had three Negro men, two of them old and decrepit, worth 45 pounds. Two women Negroes worth 30 pounds. Two Negro women children worth 20 pounds. One Negro lad worth 16. All right, the only reason you're seeing this map is again, a couple of reasons. Garish and Cut Island, you see right here. This is Kittery Point, where the Pepperells are. This says our cut, Richard Cut's land. And this over here is Portsmouth. And if you ever go, have any of you been down to Portsmouth? Um, Strawberry Bay, okay. That's what Portsmouth, early Portsmouth was called. And you see it labeled here as that. All right, now we're facing what privilege looks like. William Pepperell shows up as a 16 year old. He wants to fish, okay, or he comes over to fish. Well, he fell, falls in love with Marjorie Bray. And Marjorie Bray's father, John, house fits right on the harbor, right, right there on the harbor. This is what it looked like way back when. It was built in 1662. It has alternatively been called the oldest house in Kittery and the oldest house in Maine. Well, he, he married up. Pepperell clearly married up, marrying uh, John Bray's daughter. This home, this home was actually restored. It was going to be torn down in Daryl Hall of the music group Hall and Oak. He grew up with parents who loved restoring old homes and he restored it. But it was demolished <laughs> fairly recently, after except for a very small they section of it. It. Hmm? But After 2014, they demolished it? Yeah, most of it. Okay. He didn't. He sold it, and then it was. But that section of old, you know, going through any old town, you hit those old sections and you go, oh, these houses are amazing. Mm -hmm. But for me, I knew those houses because my, my mother would go down to Kittery, okay? But suddenly, with this story, I now know it differently. Well, he married Marjorie Bray, and now it was his turn because he was moving up in the world. So if the, if the Bray house sits right on the harbor, you go across the street and go up a hill, and as you're going up the hill, there's the tomb, <clears throat> the tomb I showed you, and the marker, and just further up the hill, is this home, except it's now even more elaborate. This is the home the young fisherman, William Pepperell, built. And because they own timber, because they own land, they had all that timber. And because they built ships and owned them, well, if you're going to have a proper home, you sent your timber across in a boat to England to be fashioned the way you wanted it to be. And then the wood came back as, look at the staircase here. Okay. And it says in this book, the house built by Colonel Pepperell, father of Sir William the Baronet, mind you, um, in 1682, surpassed in grandeur any residence in the province. That Sir William Pepperell was the son. This is now William Pepperell to the baronet. A uh, very famous New England painter, John Singleton Copley. Um, he was happy to paint for these people. <laughs> you know, um, This is the son of William Pepperell and Marjorie Bray. His wife's name was Mary Hurst. Her father was a very wealthy Bostonian. And they, he was the father to a woman named Elizabeth Pepperell who married Nathaniel Sparhawk. You'll, you'll see this sequence. They were the parents named after the father 
Uh, they were the parents of Nathaniel Sparkbuck. But this guy never had, he, he lost his only son. His son just dropped dead at 21, walking the street of Portland, Portsmouth. Um, and he had a whole pot of money and a lot of land. So what he said to his grandson, you graduate from college and change your name or add my name to your name. So you're no longer Nathaniel Sparhawk, you're Nathaniel William Heppel Sparhawk. And I'll leave my everything to you. That young man graduates from Harvard, and I have a slide that'll just knock your socks off, and marries Elizabeth Royal of the Royal Plantation in Medford, Mass. <laughs> okay, that's Sir William Pepperell, too. Okay, see the, um, the spyglass, come on. It's another magnifying glass, the spyglass, the telescope. Thank you. I tell it's coming. <laughs> the word wasn't coming. <laughs> um, he's the one who fought at the Battle of Lewisburg. That's why he had the spyglass. And that is the Pepperell House in Kittery. It still stands and it's flat out gorgeous. And here is his daughter's husband, Nathaniel Sparhawk. He was a merchant in Salem, Mass, Kittery Point, Maine, and Boston, Mass. He had several business losses during the revolution. Look at the outfits. You think they were loyalists? That's why he lost money in the revolution. Okay. Well, who helped them live that kind of lifestyle? Well, the ports and any good Athenaeum is a gold mine, and the Portsmouth Ath Athenaeum is certainly that. And I found this table taken from slavery and abolition in New Hampshire, and it was done quite a while ago, and I don't have doubt that, doubt that more information has been accumulated, all right? But I focused in on this, knowing that Margaret was likely born around 1760, all right? And I started looking at the number of Negroes and slaves who kept that population alive. Now, remember, Maine's still a part of Massachusetts, and I can't extract out those numbers. But Portsmouth and Kittery are joined at the hip. Am I boring you all, silly? <laughs> I'm totally, I'm totally hooked on these stories. But it doesn't fascinate me, and I'm afraid I'm going to bore everyone. Anyway, um, but I, the New Hampshire and Portsmouth truly are joined at the All they have to do is go over the Piscataqua River, River, and they did it all the time to go to church. Okay. Um, if Margaret was born about 1760 and enslaved by the cut family that I've identified, Richard III, there would have been about 600 enslaved Blacks nearby, some free, but mostly um, vast majority enslaved. Um, most resided in the Seacoast area. There were some in Exeter, some in Newmarket, but it was mostly Portsmouth and Kittery. They were all expected to be Christianized. You know, caught mad or demanded it. They had to attend church. It was the only way you could keep them in line, after all. And they had to stand at the back of the church or be up in the balcony. Well, I have a good friend, a Black scholar from um, Rumford, who is older than I, and I absolutely adore her. She's, she, she keeps me honest. And she keeps saying to me, Judy, they would have all known each other. They went to the market together, getting goods. Mm -hmm. They socialized in those, well, they, they allowed the socializing to occur 
in those family gatherings because they were the ones who served the people, prepared the food, grew the food, made the clothes, spun the flax. They did all that work, all right? And they simply would have known each other. So I kept growing as I was reading, and I'm telling you, I knew nothing when I got started. The English and Dutch established sugar plantations in the British West Indies and Suriname around the 1640s. Stop reading. What I ended up finding happened is farmers had moved to those islands and they were going to start small farms and they tried growing all kinds of different crops. And the way they were growing those crops was using indentured servants. All right. So they were white indentured people. But your indentureship goes up, you know, it comes up and you're suddenly free and you marry into the farmer fa farmer's family. Now you haven't got anybody to work your fields. And you have a whole other problem. The crops they tried growing initially were a bust over and over again. And when they hit upon sugar, they had it made. And when they realized they could have enslaved people come over on ships to work that terrible job, then, then they had it made because all the profits became theirs. Enslavement played an outsized role in the success of these early colonial families in Kittery that I've explored. There is a historical society person in Castine who has done the same kind of work and she has found just enormous information. But going back to my story, this is what did me in. Their wills were detailed. They were huge property holders. And in them, they bequeathed their slaves alongside their cloaks and their cattle. And all of Cape Elizabeth. Yours is Cape Elizabeth, then. I'm leaving it for you. And spur wink, why? Yours. All right? Yes. And they found, in one will, I found nine different ways this person had figured to leave his property to heirs, should a son not arrive. Uh, and their homes, you are, I, they're just amazing. You've seen the, and the cuts, Make sure, if I have time at the end, and I probably won't, make sure I tell you about the Cuts lavish parties. And if they were the parties of the home that Margaret would have lived in, okay? But the reality is they these people simply lived by English standards, what they were aspiring to. And they were the merchant class. They were, they their goal was capital gain and they lived by patriarchal privilege. That's just, that was life back then. And it started day one and it was linked to the Puritanical Church Fathers of Boston and to other shipbuilders up and down on the coast. And they did it with the blessings of their God in their own private chapels in their homes and in Queen's Chapel or North Church in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Um, do any of you have witch trial people in your family? <laughs> Hi, cousins. <laughs> um, Judge Sewell was involved in the witch trials, but he became a really good guy at this point. In 1700, Judge Sewell was so concerned for the souls of what he called this new merchant class that he actually called them out. And the document is really kind of a neat document to read. But their success made them certain about their superiority, their rights of ownership and decision-making. Mm -hmm. So they didn't pay any attention to Judge Sewell. I found this map that has been reproduced and I'd never heard the words lower bleed. And I found out what it meant. It's the parsonage area of a town. And this is a picture of the parts of the Lower Glebe in Portsmouth in 1705. Keep in mind that at that point, 
um, Margaret wouldn't have been born yet. She was still another 50 years away, 55 years away. Um, this area right here, I know you're focusing above, but no. <laughs> this is the Rector Arthur Brown's home. This is the Episcopal Chapel that was built in something like 1638. And that's where all the loyalists went to church. They were, they were loyalists. Okay, it was Episcopal. And in fact, this is, <laughs> this is where the North Church Parsonage is. And this is Court Street. Uh, by the way, have any of you been to the heart of Port, Portsmouth? Okay, it, you know, you get to center, the center square and there's that massive church in the center. Well, this is just a short ways away from this. Port Street is here. And that uncle, that 101-year-old great uncle who told me, I know where that stone is, Ginny, don't worry about it. I'll help you find it. He lived in senior housing right across here. And he calls me up and he says, Judy, you have to come down. They're digging up the street across from us. I had never, this map, he's, he died a long time ago. He would have loved this map. They started digging it up and lo and behold, what did they find exactly what is in this map? That was one of the major Negro burying grounds in the city of Portsmouth. And if you want a road trip sometime this summer, go down there and find it. New Hampshire did this amazing, just amazing thing. They, they did the research, they knew what it was, and they turned it into this walking monument that is one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life. It really is quite lovely. Okay. But remember, Arthur Brown, Rector Arthur Brown is going to become important and the Church of England, which would be Queen's Chapel. Here is Queen's Chapel. Um, one of the, and I got it from the New Hampshire Historical Society. In 1745, a bell taken at the Battle of Lewisburg in Nova Scotia by Sir William Pepperell is installed in the Queen's Chapel. Mm -hmm. So you can tell these loyalists, these very privileged loyalists, have a tight connection with their church. Okay? That church, by the way, burned. Um, you know how all of our towns have had these major fires Portsmouth had three major fires, and in 1806, that Queen's Chapel burned on Christmas Eve. Margaret would have gone to that church. She would have been expected to go to that church. And the person, I think, who introduced her to Pomp went to that church. Here is the Reverend Arthur Brown. He was the first rector of Queen's Chapel, and he served there from 1736 until 1773 when he died. Last fall, I went down to go on a walking tour with the Black Her on the Black Heritage Trail in New England. Um, if any of you do this kind of research, you're going to want to get on their site because they have a database to die for. It's just fabulous. And um, what do I find but this tiny sign right here? That's Arthur Brown's house. That's Rector Arthur Brown's house. And it's now the office for the Black Heritage Trail. And there should be another two right there. It's 222 Fourth Street. But here's the key the reason you're seeing him is he was the enslaver of the man named Jesse Brown. I showed you this book before that Glenn Knobloch did. Strong and Brave Fellows. I'll introduce you. Glenn, and that's where, this is where I found Pong in this book. Well, I'm racking my brain thinking, how would Peggy meet Pong? There's nobody in Wilton and Amherst, New Hampshire, 
these towns are so brand new that there's one black here and one black three towns over. Okay. Um, and then I got thinking and I went to Glenn's book and I started pouring through because he has so many soldiers and sailors, sailors listed. This is what he wrote. Jesse Brown was the servant of one of Portsmouth's most renowned citizens, the Reverend Arthur Brown, the first rector of Queen's Chapel, serving until his death in 1773. And I find that he willed Jesse to his wife. But in doing research on the Brown family, I found out his wife died six months before. Okay, so that means the rector dies his wife's already gone. Where's Jesse? I find that his daughter is figuring out how she can sell the second enslaved man in the family. Jesse did exactly what Ad Adelaide, my friend Adelaide tells me. Jesse walked away, which you could do, and it happened often at least during this time period. It got much harder when we had people gathering up slaves and taking them south. Jesse Brown, well, wait a minute. Did I finish telling you? Jesse, well, I say the same thing. Jesse Brown joined Moses Nichols Regiment. Remember Moses Nichols is the man who married Peggy and and, and Tom? And Pomp was in Moses Nichols' regiment. And they both served at the Battle of Bennington, and there is no one else that I can find who fit that bill. So my theory, purely a theory, is that Jesse Brown knew Pomp Russell, as Adelaide said, they they found each other. Okay. And he would have known Margaret because she was growing up in the homes and the church that he had to go to. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Did I say it in a way that made sense? Mm -hmm. Am I repeating myself too many? Yeah, yeah, that's been great. Okay, this is the North Church. Here are where all our rebel ancestors went to church, mind you. Uh, William Whipple was there, um, John Langdon, Daniel Webster, George Washington worshiped there. Well, William Whipple, who signed the Declaration of Independence and had Pomp, had Prince Whipple go to war with him. Honest to goodness, Old Portsmouth is fun to go to. The, the Moffat Lad House is owned and maintained by. The, is it the colonial names? Isn't there a group called the colonial names? They are the ones who maintain that home. And they are beginning to reckon with the amount of enslavement that went on. Okay. And Whipple married a Moffat. You don't need to know more than that. <laughs> so I needed to jump back again and come up with a woman. Now I'm imagining Margaret growing up. And it's one thing if you were a black soldier, when George Washington finally said, yeah, we really do need help. There was a time period when he said, I want no black soldiers. Okay. But he said, yeah, we really do need help. Well, those men heard that promise of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Why would we think the women wouldn't? They were the ones serving the people at the dinner table. They were hearing the conversations that the men were having who were going to war against Great Britain. All right. What was an enslaved woman's life like? Well, I went to the Gerda Lerner Library at Yale. Elizabeth Brown was born into slavery near Hartford, Connecticut in 1746, and by many accounts was evidently freed when she turned. 18 in 1764. Pomp and Peggy would have been about three. Um, she spent more than 10 years contracting her service out while living freely and independently. 
until during the Revolutionary War era, she was taken by three men and sold to several successive owners. In 1797, after more than 20 years of re-enslavement that took her to Albany, New York, her case finally came to the attention of the New York Manumission Society. Her advocate in the case listed several different witnesses who could attest to Elizabeth's freedom and ended by hoping that the society would do what they could to attempt to aid a destitute and helpless human being. As an aside, it was exactly the opposite in wealth. Pomp's extended family, though white, saw Pomp as family. He simply was. He wasn't, it doesn't appear he ever was to his parents, to the Russell parents who still lived in Wilton, New Hampshire. But to his brothers and sisters and sisters-in-law in Weld, Maine, he was one of them. That's why they started the anti-slavery societies in Weld and Farmington. It has to be. So you don't have to read my mess. You have to know that I was reminded at our genealogy conference how much I love timelines. <laughs> what I did is I needed to know more about Maine and the Kittery area. And I went, can you tell I've used this book a lot? <laughs> okay. Um, a woman, Pat Q. Wall, who is probably in her mid-90s now, did the kindest of service to all of us. She wrote a book called Lives of Consequence. He scoured the records looking for Blacks in early Kittery and Berwick. And she did it because she belonged to that little, you haven't seen a picture of it, and I don't have it, a little tiny Kittery church that was actually just opposite that beautiful Pepperell House, that great big white Pepperell House. Um, and she found markings up there, and it was where enslaved people had to sit up in the balcony. And it sparked her interest and she started doing research. Hmm. Okay, so what I did is I took Margaret's book, I uh, Pat's book, and I did a timeline starting with the earliest she found. And I only focused on the Cut, Elliot, Garish, Pepperell, and Sparhawk families. I could have added more, but those were the ones that were showing up related to Margaret. Okay, and the very first cut. What do I find? He comes over with three men, two women, a boy, and two children. And I went on, and I'm not going to bore you with those. But far later into this project, I went, you know, I will never find her ancestors. But I wonder if there was a mother there. Could I just make myself feel good about that? Something that I can't possibly ever prove. And I found that Richard III and Eunice had a woman living with them in 1752 named Lydia. And I just have this fantasy, wouldn't that be wonderful if Margaret actually grew up with her mother? That's pure fantasy. And you don't have to look at that mess there. <laughs> but what matters on this side is this cut line allowed me to see all as it started out as a very simple worksheet. I promise you it was so simple to begin with. And then I began to see all the connections. You can see the little arrows. My theory around the cut surname uh, linked to Margaret as Pomp Russell's wife is, as I've said before, she was likely enslaved by Richard III and Eunice Curtis Hunt. They of what were called the lavish parties, servants in livery, barges, and very many enslaved. Margaret's mother, possibly father, could have been from the Barbados because Robert I married, when his first wife died very early on, he married a woman named Mary Hole, and Mary Hole. 
um, was the minister's daughter <coughs> and he owned a plantation. And they showed up with the dozen enslaved when they settled. Margaret's ancestry, I think I have to safely assume they're from West Africa because the vast majority were. Um, but this was the thing I had to reckon with. My ancestors intermarried with uh, Robert, Richard II, and Richard III, and sister Joanna Cup's families with all these little lines. And the Brays and Pepperells and Cuts built the ships. So remember that Daniel Sparhawk who's going to get all of his grandfather's money if he changes his name? Well, I went, oh, the Massachusetts Historical Society has all this cool stuff online. And um, I went looking for ads because I had to have a sense of what, if you wanted somebody, how did you get them? What did it look like? What did you write for ads? Okay, and I stumbled across a paper the Boston Post Boy and Advertiser. And if I had another whole half hour, I would tell you that the printers are Russell and Green, and the Russell are been able to possibly connect to how the Russell family got home. But it's it's kind of iffy, but it's pretty likely because that Russell, this Russell, you'll find out dealt with that. So I put this paper in here because it knocked my socks off and it's like one of those th magical things you stumble across. This is a paper from July 22nd, 1765. And this is the graduating class of Harvard. Well, son of a gun. Who's right there? Nathaniel Sparhawk. He's the very first person on that list. And I'm going, oh my God, he was a good student. That's a lie. It is student. a lie. <laughs> and you know one. why? Because he was the richest one. He was the richest one. <laughs> they ranked him by privilege. <laughs> and he was Pepperell and Sparhawk. Okay. They changed that shortly after. There was a huge, I don't know when it was changed, but I remember reading it was. Okay. But when I saw his name up there, it was like, how did I stumble upon that particular paper in looking for ads? And people have said to me, Judy, a servant, how can, what's the difference? You know, you're a servant. Well, I found this ad, a white man servant. For a small family, such a person may have good wages if it can be recommended. And then I saw this one. Well, if you want a sloop, 65 tons, a prime sailor, fresh cork. You can get it at the Long War. Go, talk to Jay Russell, who was one of the two printers, okay? to be sold as good a horse and chaise as any in America, I love that one, inquire at Green and Russell. To be sold, not being wanted, a very likely Negro girl, 10 years of age, inquire at the printers. Okay. William Pepperell wanted his daughter to live in luxury, he did. That's the house he built for Elizabeth as a marriage present. And she and Nathaniel lived in it. Okay. And it's their son who was on that Harvard graduating class. I needed to find, figure out if I could connect the Pepperells and the Sparhawks to the Royals. This slide is in here because of this particular line. The royals we know are were slave traders and big time plantation owners. William I came over as an indentured servant. He moved to North Yarmouth, Mass, uh, New at Maine, and his son became a carpenter. And when his son was three, 
he moved back to Dorchester, Massachusetts. Isaac, second generation, had a son that of course he named after himself, Isaac. Isaac III, as a teen, became a merchant mariner. Dorchester, so close, okay, to the water. And in 1700, he buys a sugar plantation in Antigua. He marries a woman and he moves to Medford, Mass, keeping his sugar plantation going strong and builds the what is now called the, the Isaac Royal Plantation and Slave Quarters that I'll show you a picture of. They arrived with 27 slaves. So of course they needed the slave quarters and those slave quarters are still intact. All right, they had a son, Isaac, who married Elizabeth and her family owned a plantation in Suriname. All right, his daughter, was the one who married Nathaniel Sparhawk. So that's how they're all connected. And there is a postcard of that plantation. Okay. I initially thought this was a gratuitous slide and I almost took it out, but I can't take it out because it's one of my favorite slides. So it probably is gratuitous, uh, but it's important in the Palm Russell story, Heather. Okay, this is a 1770 etching by Paul Revere. It was of the landing of the troop, British troops in 1768. I put it in because here is the Long War. And in the Weld story, of, in Pomp story, Weld, Maine is named for Benjamin Weld. Benjamin Weld was the assistant custom direct, customs director. Yeah, it's not director, it's something close to that. Customs, he was the head of the customs house That's in Boston on the long wall. Deputy collector of the customs house. Yeah, okay. And look who owns at least Five, three of these five story warehouses on the Long Wharf is William Phillips. William Phillips originally owned the Weldland. He bought it all and then had Jacob Abbott sell it. Okay. And that connection goes all the way back to. I won't do it. I'll get sidetracked. Don't let me get sidetracked. It's a really cool piece of the puzzle. Though. Anyway, the Long Wharf is a really big deal for me because, yes, it's fine. The, the ships can now sidle right up to the Long Wharf. Um, these other wharfs, they had to use barges to lug the goods from the sheds to the ships or, or from the ships to load. Think about the ships that would have come in here. Who would have been unloading or loading the goods? And who, besides what goods came off, what people came off, what other enslaved people? Because this is where they would have landed, okay? Here, this is here only because I was intrigued. Here is the custom house record that is printed regularly in the paper at the time. Ships entering in, ships that are about to head out, outward bound, and ships that cleared out. And it lists the name of the ship and where they're headed and where they've come from. And this tiny piece I had to leave in here. Buried in the town of Boston since our last. Six whites, no blacks baptized in several churches, eight. So they put those kinds of statistics in all over the place, reading those early papers. Here you've got to be sold, a likely valuable Negro woman about 30 years of age. She is an excellent cook and can do all kinds of business in the family. Or look, wanted to charter a sloop or schooner. I'll take whichever, because I want to go to the Bay of Honduras 
just come and meet me at the British Coffee House. Okay, but this is the poignant one for me. To be sold, a likely young Negro girl. She will be sold reasonably, has had the smallpox. Do you think she was being sold because her face was popped from the smallpox? And you wouldn't want her coming to the dining room table because that might upset your stomach. Um, and here's another one, a healthy, tractable Negro girl, uh, about 18 years of age. So I went back to the f and and I was looking for ships. You can see I wandered all over the place. Okay, and I found this lovely piece that is probably far more richly extended because there is a woman in Maine who works now for the museum on the mall, the African American Museum, mm -hmm. and she has done tons of work on vessels. All right, but I clipped this lower part because, and I started with 1761, thinking of Margaret being born about then. What they did, and what this author did, this researcher did, is she said, okay, what year was it built? What's the date of the voyage? Do we know a ship name, the place of construction, the rigged and tonnage, the number of slaves embarking and those disembarking, the landing, where they landed, and who owned the ships? Well, the ships are all built in either Portsmouth or Piscataqua, which would be Kittery, okay? Right in that little place in the map. The ships I, wore, I was paying attention to in this block, one was from the US. The rest were from Great Britain. Look where they landed, South Carolina, Jamaica, Barbados, St. Kitts, Jamaica, Jamaica, Tortola. And these were the slaves. Why do you think they were sending them there? And the numbers blew me right away. So at this one, the Black Prince was a schooner. It had 186 and only 145 survived. Um, 65 died on this one, 32 died on this one. And you can do the math on all of them. I particularly noted the name of this ship because there were three Cut Brothers and the Cut Brothers built the ships. That's a wild guess on my part. I would, as a researcher, need to dig that through. I'm not getting sidetracked <laughs> right now. But this is the thing that makes it even harder. What happened, remember I said I used the anti-slavery of Almanac? Well, I found this one from 1839. And we're at the point in this country where the Blacks are no longer being enslaved. They are free. What are we going to do with them? There is a, I always say this name wrong, there is a colonization, colonialization, colonization, I always spoof it, movement. And the movement is to, it's going to make it easier for everybody if the Blacks go somewhere else. So we need to send them back to Africa. So we've got Liberia. So we will use Liberia. This is a ship that was built in Portsmouth, the Nightingale. It was built in 1851. Pomp had been dead for 15 years. It sailed to Liberia in 1861. 961 people got on, 800 enslaved, now free, got on. 160 died on route. That's a huge number. And what struck me, the reason I used this slide is because Portsmouth was now getting really active and they wanted to educate people. And, and the women were feisty. They wanted their children educated. They knew it mattered and they were going to make it happen. All right, so here are colored scholars being excluded from school. See the teacher? Okay. Here is a quote by a man from New Hampshire, a minister 
from New Hampshire, <coughs> excuse me, who moved to the South. If the free colored people were generally taught to read, it might induce them to remain in this country. We would offer them no such inducements. Reverend Mr. Converse, a colonizationist, formerly of New Hampshire, now editor of the Southern Religious Telegraph. Okay, so my people are all shipbuilders, slave owners and merchants, and slave traders. And here we're back to Garish Island and Cut Island. What I didn't tell you is in 17, I did tell you that in 1773, we know Richard Cut had at least a dozen enslaved on the island. He couldn't have had a lavish party if he didn't have enough people. All right. He had a drawbridge. There was actually a drawbridge on that island. And they would raise it at night to keep the family and the enslaved in. And to protect them from the indigenous. And then they would lower it down. Margaret was born 30 years later when Richard Cut III was 60 years old, 68 years old. Okay, so here's my theory again. Margaret was likely owned by Richard Cut III and Eunice Curtis Cut of Cut Island in Kittery. This is the land of the drawbridge and the lavish parties. Margaret would have known Jesse Brown from attending his owner and enslaver's church, Reverend, what's his name, Arthur Brown, um, the Queen's Chapel. Arthur Brown was the rector. He was, that meant he was a major player in the social fabric of the loyalist community, and it was a relatively small community. The rest of us were rebels. Okay, or for hoping for the other side. So he socialized with them. He, Rector Brown, really socialized with them. So Jesse would have been accompanying Brown as his as his servant. And he would have known Margaret by, um, Margaret would have known him by encountering him as they attended those required responsibilities they had but third of all, because in Portsmouth, they allowed the Blacks to gather on certain Sundays to socialize, okay? Jesse would have known Palm Russell, both for, uh, because both of them served at the Battle of Bennington under Moses Nichols. Palm Russell himself could have met and easily, having learned of Margaret, could have met and easily courted her because Kittery was only 45 miles away and that was considered a day's horse ride, okay? And Margaret could have been freed or freed herself by age 27 when she got married in 1788 because Richard III who would have owned her was already 97 or 90 and close to death. So I'm going to, I've gone on too long. I'm going to skip these last couple of slides. Is that, can you live with that? <laughs> okay. All, all I'll say about this is Margaret's adolescence, in her adolescence, she would have known incredibly strong Black women, including um, uh, Dinah Chase Whipple, Prince Whipple's wife who was starting a school for blacks. And they would have known each other for nine years. So the slave population in New Hampshire and Maine have defined slavery was abolished in 1783. The revolu black revolutionary soldiers were pursuing their quest for freedom. Margaret's enslavers were elderly. This I want you to hear. Her black women friends were a communicative an empowered community with their own desire for freedom. They had substantial skills, the skills they needed to learn to run the households for everyone else. And they birthed their own babies. They healed each other. They had, they had an economy of labor that was substantial. They were familiar with English societal customs 
from music and social prior uh, proprieties to education. They had their own deep spiritual belief system and expectations for behavior. And it wasn't just because they were going to get in trouble. They had clear expectations of what it was to be Christian as they knew what Christianity meant, um, plus their other faith beliefs. And they had an evolving commitment to educating themselves and their children. Margaret, when she moved to Wells, would have known all these people who would have been her sisters. Could Margaret have walked away? As I believe prompted, yes. So this is my last slide. An early photograph of a young black woman, sadly unnamed, source unknown. And finally, I can imagine a free young black woman, Margaret Cup, who married Pump Russell and helped settle Packersfield, New Hampshire and Weld, Maine. And I can almost hear Peggy singing in the Brown Church Choir in Weld and Pump quietly playing his fiddle for her at the end of the day. And you were. <laughs> Any questions? We kept you for a terribly long time. Yes. Do you, in your research, do you know anything about what happened to this, these 800 people that went to Liberia? No, I haven't done that research. I mean, are they treated like the immigrants here who arrive and? I, I think what little I know, I wouldn't share with you because I don't know enough. I'm too ignorant. Yes. Um, not, a, not a question or comment. Um, I had the opportunity to go to the African American Museum in DC for, for two hours. So clearly that was just like walking into a bathroom. But anyway, I know. Um, the genealogy department there is unbelievable <clears throat> wealth of information that they have. So. I, I hope you've gone and I hope I have gone, it. but I haven't, but I, I haven't, I want when it first opened. Yeah. Okay. And that's a really good bit of advice for yeah. me to do that. Yeah. And it, it just, they, and I, and I was like, whoa, this is a whole set of people that they're putting names to yeah. and women with names. And so just that, yeah. you know, I, I know how hard my genealogy is. I haven't had to tap into any of that and and I can't imagine that. So I was just yeah. if you can please oh yeah that anyway. is a great idea. Yeah. And you want to know how lavish the parties were? Sure. <laughs> imagine you arrive at the harbor at uh Hittery Point. Okay. And you're met by barges with black men in full livery who will pull you down to Richard and Eunice, Eunice's home, which has been, the description is amazing. Colby Prof wrote a piece about it, that was an amazing piece of research. And the people had prepared, the, the enslaved had prepared all the food. They had obviously tended all the gardens to provide the food. They had obviously uh, slaughtered the sheep to provide for the lavish meals that went through the whole day. Well, you and I strolled through the home and the gardens, and then you boarded the barge again, and you were pulled back to Kittery Point so that you could then get over to your Portsmouth home or your Kittery. <laughs> it must have been beyond the pale. I mean, just amazing. Uh, any other questions? What? Were there white servants as well? No. It seems like 27 people couldn't have done all of that work or however many there were. I don't believe so. I've come across no white servants. In the study I've been doing in Vermont, I've got white servants um, okay. identified, but I've not. No, that doesn't mean there couldn't be, but I've seen no records that indicate there were white servants. Okay. Now they're called children. And that was certainly true in the Moffat Lag House that they were black enslaved. And uh, the colonial dames point that out. 